next episode of the Disrupt Ed interviews. Um, today we have a special guest that's um, beaming in all the way um, from Finland. We, we were like passing ships in the night for a while trying to set up a date. I was terrible at working out what time it was on the other side of the world, which wasn't helping. Um, Lasse is joining us from Finland and he's part of um, the 100 group, I guess is what you would call it, and has done a whole lot of work um, with schools from around Finland, but increasingly around the globe. So um, I'll let um, Lasse e introduce himself and and maybe introduce his context as well welcome thank you for joining us thank you for the for the invitation it's <laughs> it's a pleasure to join the disruptive tv <laughs> so yes i'm part of the part of the hundred uh, i work as executive director uh, in our organization and and like all of us in the education field during the last weeks and months we have been extremely focused on the effects of uh, COVID COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, which have been affecting the one point five billion students' lives at, at at the point, and the number is growing. So, mm -hmm. so that is that is where our focus has been during the last last few weeks, trying to identify solutions and practices which could potentially help teachers and students around the world to get through the this this very special time. Uh, mm -hmm. And so do you want to tell us a little bit about the background of 100 in, in terms of what you're trying to achieve? Because I imagine it's something that actually there might be a number of New Zealand schools and educators that have something to contribute to that project as well. Well, we have been picking up the, the finest from New Zealand since our head of research is actually from Auckland, Chris Petrie, and uh, he joined us last year. Uh, so we have some strings attached to New Zealand as well. But how everything started for us in, in 2015, 100 was created as a celebration project for uh, 100 years of Finnish independence. And uh, our aim in the beginning was to highlight 100 Finnish solutions and practices, uh, package them well and give them as a gift to the world um, and, and to celebrate the excellent Finnish education system. And, and while we were doing that, there was a growing number of people around the world saying like, hey guys, you should actually be doing that for international education innovations as well. And we maybe thought about it for five seconds and then we decided, okay, let's go for it. So this is, sounds like an ex excellent idea. And since 2017, we have been already always publishing 100 inspiring educational innovations around the world. And, and then on top of that, we are doing a little bit smaller collections, which we call spotlights. And those are always focusing on uh, some certain team or specific region and how the education innovations can, can improve uh, the education system in, in that context. So at the moment we are, we are working totally globally and I believe our team is having internal team is having seven different nationalities and on top of that we are having this big big network of volunteer education specialists around the world which we call as 100 ambassadors and 100 academy members who are helping us to select the most impactful educational innovations around the world yeah and i always feel like um finland's nearly become um a mythical creature when it comes to education like it's it's always plucked out of the sky as sort of um a bit of an ideal when it comes to educational solutions and an approach to education um you know why do you think that is and 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 what do you think are the key things that people keep coming back to about the the Finnish education system i think the main reason behind of that is is that we are striving for equity and excellence in all the actions inside of the education system. And as an example, uh, for example, now when when the, the schools are closed, uh, there has been a big, big movement to making sure that the education provided uh, through the distance learning methods and so forth would be allowing the students with different backgrounds and different kind of like social economic uh, backgrounds uh, to have the best possible education in this very special context we are living now. And, and then on top of that, there is also a lot of like different kind of social services tied up with the educational services. So uh, for example, in a capital region where I'm currently in a lockdown position, <laughs> we, are, we are offering 
free school meals still for the students. So parents can, can go to the schools, pick up the meals for the for the kids for for the week, uh, mm. and and that's kind of like how the society and the educational system is trying to provide that kind of safe environment for the students and young people in general so that the learning could still take place even though the situation is is quite extraordinary yeah yeah so it's not all just about technology and digital divides it's about um, really addressing the social and economic divide and doing it at quite a systemic level. Like here in New Zealand, we've got plenty of schools who have jumped into that space and who have tried to, um, um, you know, address those issues. And we have some um, not-for-profits that um, do some programs around providing some meals. But it, it feels like it's quite patchy. It's never been at that complete system level. Um, and I, I suspect, in a sense, we're probably moving more in that direction recently. But I, I can understand that that would be such a key part of, you know, you can only deliver effective education if you deal with all the social and emotional stuff that sits... Um, you know, the challenges that sit within society. Um, and so what is it that um, it's been like for um, your schools locally in the last few weeks? You've just said you've come out of, you're just about to come out of three weeks of lockdown. Um, what has that looked like in Finland? How did you manage that? Well, I think there has been as as many different stories than there is people in a lockdown at the, mo at the moment. So uh, what happened in Finland? Uh, some three weeks ago, uh, the government declared that, okay, this is now uh, becoming a national emergency. Um, and uh, it, it was decided that the schools will be closed uh, with few exceptions. So, for example, um, if you are working in a, in a special occupation as a, in a health sector or uh, in a security sector, or so forth, you have been still able to bring your kids to the school. So, so the society is trying to make it sure that all of those people we are really much needing at the moment will be able to do what they do best. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, still there are some social services provided through the schools, like the school meals for the ones who are needing it. Uh, mm -hmm. and and that's very important so that that's a little bit lowering the burden uh with the families at the moment who most of them are working from home together with their kids and and trying to balance the daily routines with this new normal we are now in um and uh, of course it was a huge shift in the education sector there were more or less three days time from the from the decision to being made when it was uh, applied into a practice uh, to shift the education provided into a distance learning methods. Uh, so, of course, you know, we were in a way good position with that one because most of the primary schools and all of them are already using di different online related uh, services. Yeah. Um, but still, we have exactly the same problems than most of the OECD countries. For example, if you look at the PISA results, which is saying that only a minority of 15-year-olds are having an access to a computer, which they can use for, for learning in their yeah. home environment. So then suddenly you might have a situation that you have two or three kids at home who would need to share that those one or two computers and phones to be able to be part of the contact teaching, which is provided through online, online tools. Um, so it's not it's not easy, and uh, mm -hmm. like in New Zealand, also in Finland, many NGOs have been stepping up. For example, there is a, there has been one big movement which ha has been collecting uh, computers from uh, businesses, meaning computers which are not anymore used in the business setting, and then donating those to the families in need. So so there would be a possibility for that online learning experience in its full. Yeah. So. Uh, it's a, it's a big stretch uh, for all of us to make make the things happen. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about the um, the paper that you produced or the um, publication that you produced that um, I shared on our disruptive page the other day, and it was the um, one that you did in partnership with OECD um, about the interventions and solutions and recommendations um, in this in this period of time. Yes, so um, the idea behind of the spotlight 
spotlight paper we created about the pandemic situation was to highlight different solutions and practices on a very concrete level. Mm. So what we realized during the first one and a half weeks when the situation really emerged, that all of a sudden they were public, like people were publishing different kind of lists of resources or uh, different organizations were saying like now you can use our service for free yeah, or kind yeah. of like giving these different possibilities for teachers and educators to switch to online learning, which was great. And at the same time, we had the feeling like is this actually helpful or is mm -hmm. this actually creating more confusion? So what if we would try to narrow down a little bit of the different approaches there are, trying to kind of like provide information about the different solutions and practices which can be used and applied in this situation. So then together with OACD, we want you to first create this kind of overall picture of, yeah. of the situation and then to highlight which are kind of like the high quality resources like provided by National Geographic or some other big corporate corporations and organizations, but then also which are kind of like the highly scalable and impactful innovations which seems to be working and emerging in this situation quite well. And then looking also to different kind of uh, toolkits and solution packages, um, which, are the, which are also providing educational experiences and educational improvement in a situation where there is no online tools available or yeah. you know different kind of things what you can do in a neighborhood and or uh, and and so forth to help help the anxiety and and things like that which students might and will feel in in this kind of special situation so it was it was pointedly designed to be a, quite a pragmatic document exactly and exactly useful, rather than a, a, a meaty sort of pedagogical study of um of approaches per se is, is there what are your plans um in terms of what to do next in terms of gathering stories around um innovations because i think the tools and the technologies and the materials are really important and um they're definitely you know i think i think you're absolutely right we saw the same thing here in new zealand with all of a sudden every supplier known to man suddenly offering you a free trial for the next few months um you know and um we as a school came down really hard on that and said, look, less is more, um, you know, less is more is going to um, really serve our students well. But um, then our really big um, piece of work now is is come right back to sort of the, the pedagogy and actually working out what matters in terms of um, we've discovered very quickly that you need to power it right back to threshold concepts and skills. And it's been a really interesting exercise in our teachers working out what matters because I think it's become very clear very quickly that you're going to have to actually, we're now facing potentially weeks and weeks of our students working remotely and from home. Um, and, you know, as well as powering everything back, everyone keeps coming back to the thing that actually what they care about most is well-being <laughs> and, and looking after the well-being. Now, you mentioned some other work that you did in the past that was around that well-being space as well and um, have you seen a real step up in um, solutions and strategies and interventions that are at, that are focused on the well-being of the young people mm -hmm. um, we have been putting together a blog post together with the good colleagues from a brookings institute from washington dc and uh, there are like three things we were planning to highlight in that that upcoming piece of work and uh, one of them is that like we should be focusing on the systems and solutions we have been already using in this situation. Yeah. So in a way, like you were also mentioning, let's try to reduce the noise. Let's try to kind of like create a, that safe environment mm. uh, where we can we, where we can make learning happen. So I think that is like the first principle, uh, because if there is a lot of confusion and a lot of new things which you have to suddenly learn in this this situation, it will increase the anxiety among the students, and yeah. which will then automatically lower the well-being uh, and student motivation as as well. Then the second piece is is that we should be sticking with quite simple solutions and simple practices at least in the beginning so we have to make the students familiar with the situation we have to support the parents to keep up with the with the learning happening at home um, 
and and most likely we have to be able to help parents to have those pedagogical discussions because now the students are at home and yeah. I, I think it might be also a beautiful thing in many cases uh, so that the parents are actually seeing how the learning process is happening and and also having a first-hand experience that the learning experience might be a little bit different uh, than it was when they were at school yeah, um, yeah. and and then the third thing is that that the teacher should be paying a lot of attention towards the students who are needing the extra support who might not be in a lucky situation or have a super supporting parents uh, yeah. but and and uh, and the teachers sh should be able to and i know it's a lot to ask that they should be able to have a leadership in that learning process also with them and find time to have a phone call have a time to have that video chat and yeah. to see how the student is actually doing because what is all already now very visible is that this situation will hit the hardest the ones who, who would need the education and the school support the most so yeah. we, we are for example seeing in our finnish context that there might be some students who are not you know joining the online lessons who are kind of like dropping out from that loop and it might not be only so that they don't want to do it by themselves it might be so that the family isn't supporting they might know there might be no computers or internet yeah. access or something else so that they could be part of it yeah. and and uh, that's something where we should be paying a lot of attention at the moment because otherwise those problems might be becoming bigger for the next school year yeah and and what's your timeline looking like now you're at the end of you said three weeks of full lockdown um and mm -hmm. did you say that was being lifted now what does that look like for you does that look like students going back to school completely or optional or what well the travel restrictions are now being lifted inside of finland so mm -hmm. so we are free to move around it's not uh suggested or uh so we should be staying where we are at the moment and 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 prevent from all unnecessary travel um, and then at the moment the schools might open up again again in mid-may but it might change so this yeah. so the students are still learning from home at least for one more month well, okay, so you do have some ex um, extended remote learning time. And and one of the big conversations we've been having here in New Zealand and this, is this idea that we're actually got this sort of once in a pandemic opportunity to design a new normal for our schools and um, big conversations about how we can leverage from what we're learning in this context and make changes to our school system when we come out, you know, whenever that might be, come out of the other end of all of this. And one thing that's um, really struck us, particularly as a senior school, is the desire to have a far more self-directed style of teaching and learning. Because actually, if you want to be agile and you want to move in and out of these spaces, it, a lot of it relies on that sort of learner agency and their ability to be able to effectively lead their own learning. Um, is there a sense um, in, in Finland that you, you, this will result in any changes within the wider system beyond lockdown? Uh, that's an excellent question. And and I, I believe like it remains to be seen at the moment. So yeah. we are fully focusing on providing that good quality education for all in, in this very special situation. Luckily, the Finnish um, curriculum is quite flexible. Yeah. So what what many of the teachers are saying at the moment they have been trying to use project based learning methods and and using this 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 situation as a something where you can also learn or then to tie up the normal household related task to a learning mm. process is like okay today let's learn about recycling what what how does the waste control at your home look like so so yeah. are you kind of like recycling and this is what you could be doing and maybe take out the trust and at the same time help out the parents a little bit yeah so, so, I, so kind of like so kind of like trying to trying to use clever ways to tap into the family life in a way that the student is also helping uh, in, in the situation
Yeah, yeah, and we, I think we, we, we actually as a school have a real focus on project-based learning. We, we collapse our curriculum on a Wednesday, and so our students, it's a really normal part of their being. And But I, I also think we're seeing a real spike in people contextualising the learning. I suspect that's that sort of similarity that we have with Finland is that flexibility of our curriculum and our teachers actually having an incredible amount of um, freedom to be creative with how they deliver the teaching and, and the learning. Um, so, so just in closing, can you tell us a little bit, how can people get in touch and find out more about the work you're doing and any ongoing um, publications that you develop around this, this sort of area? So the easiest way is to head, head to 100.org website and, and to find out what's happening. So uh, from our website, you can find over 1,000 educational solutions and practices um, from our innovation section. And then if you are interested in, in the most inspiring ones we selected for this year, you can find that collection and, and take a deeper look in, in those ones. Or if you are a math teacher or, uh, or biology teacher and you want to find okay, what would be relevant for you, you can use the search functionality to find exactly those innovations around the world. And then of course, you know, you can go to Facebook, you can be part of our community. We are always welcoming educators and teachers to join us the community and help each other. So those are the easiest ways to tag along. And, uh, but I would have actually one question to you as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now the tables are turning. So yeah, I'm actually this is on the cards. <laughs> so so something what I wanted to, to ask is that like there has been a lot of discussion that New Zealand is taking some social emotional learning uh, very very deeply inside the curriculum. So how have you been using any of any of those like insights or learnings? from that aspect in this situation? Um, I, th I think it, it will vary from sort of age group to age group, but I, I know in the last two schools I've been, I mean, yes, we do have um, our health and wellbeing. I mean, as a country, you know, we've, we've got a wellbeing focus around our um, economy um, as, as a measure of success. So it, it's very much a, a whole country focus, but yeah, absolutely health and wellbeing. And we refer to it as Hilda, a Maori term for um, sort of holistic approach to wellbeing is a huge part of the New Zealand curriculum. But what we're seeing, I think, particularly in um, our secondary schools and, and the last two schools that I've been lucky enough to be in leadership in, Hobbs and Four Point Secondary School and now at Albany Senior School, um, and a number of um, the more recently opened schools have actually broken down their curriculum into three distinct areas. And so rather than um, the specialist subjects and the learning areas completely dominating the week. Um, there's a number of schools now where we have three prongs to our um, curriculum design. Um, one third is the specialist subjects and the learning area. And for the most part in those schools, those are delivered and really connected and um, sort of um, in, in, in modules where subjects are, are, are combined and connected and um, sort of delivered in more thematic ways and approaches. Um, all of us have a real focus on project-based learning. So um, most of these new schools now have a dedicated day or, or most of a day a week where we collapse the timetable completely and students are engaged in project-based learning that is about serving the wider community, making an impact in their community um, and creating a product or a solution or a business or something that's very much about meeting a very real need or solving a very real problem. But then the third part of our curriculum is what we call tutorials at um, Albany Senior High School, what we call Learning Hub um, at um, Hobsonville Point Secondary School. And that has a really um, well-being, um, wellness focus in terms of small groups. So we call them Fano or homerooms or family groups, uh, which are multi-leveled age groups of students. And um, they are given a decent timetable chunk of the week. So um, for instance, at Albany Senior High School, that looks like 200 minutes um, where a week where they're set aside to have a really one-on-one -on -one connection with that adult and um, it is their job to um, 
sort of support the well-being of the student, help sit alongside them as a learning coach to make sure that they've got goals, but also to help them um, to construct sort of plans around looking after their well-being um, in, a, in a holistic sense and, and to work alongside them um, and support them in a, in a far more sort of one-on-one -on -one um, way and um, most of these schools, um, Albany included, tend to have a, a, a sort of a curriculum that they've correct, constructed in that space. And for us, it's about health and well-being. It's about financial literacy. It's about um, career and life skill planning, um, and it's about citizenship and those things that go beyond the traditional subjects. So that's a, mm -hmm. a big part of it. So. Um, and I, I think increasingly, um, and particularly, I think that will be our, our change that we see that will come out of this period, is that everyone, I've, like I work with a lot of principals around the country, and everyone's whole thing is, don't really care about assessment at the moment. You know, yep, we care about learning, but actually the number one thing we care about is that our students um, are, are okay and, and looking after their well-being and the care of the learner. And um, it's really interesting because we're just about to have sort of national level announcements about what we're going to do in terms of our qualification framework um, next week. Because we're, we're, we're sort of at the beginning of our school year. Our school year goes to November, December. And um, I have a susp sneaking suspicion that our ministry underestimates the impact that this is having on the learning and so therefore won't actually reduce the expectations. And I have a feeling that our principals are just going to make the call themselves that actually it's not the priority for our students this year because actually mm -hmm. what matters is is yeah. the well-being. And it's affecting your school system much more than ours because, mm. you know, we are one and a half months away from the summer holidays at the moment. Yeah. So kind of like teachers and everybody are like praising it together. Like, okay, yeah. we have to be able to go one one and a half months more and then let's have a break and let's think during the summer how we will build up the next school year but yeah. you are in a in a kind of a like moving yeah. train already by now and uh, it will have a tremendous aff effect to the rest yeah. of the school year yeah absolutely and um you know we're just heading into winter and um you know and we've got something like they moved our school holidays forward so we've got a 12-week term ahead of us and we're all going what are we doing? <laughs> okay, yeah. we're doing this all from home. Okay, let's work it out. But it's it's really, in, I mean, one thing about New Zealand is we do have that flexibility of our curriculum. Our schools do have, an, we have self-governing schools who actually, as long as their boards of trustees are on board, can be incredibly creative and innovative in how they deliver teaching and learning. And it's going to be an incredible opportunity for people to exercise those freedoms. For the most part, people haven't. I think we've just carried on as a country delivering relatively traditional education but with some real areas of innovation and pockets of innovation um, but I think we've seen in terms of digital pedagogy we've seen things shift momentously in a matter of weeks we've mm -hmm. seen our government step in and provide a whole lot of technology and deliver they're now currying the you know laptops to homes um, to try and close the digital divide and modems to homes to try and make sure that as many homes as possible are connected. So um, I, I hold out hope that we will have actually moved the digital infrastructure and closed the digital divide and have forced our schools to be creative in a way that they haven't had to be for a long time. And I feel quite optimistic. I think it's going to be an exhausting year but I'm optimistic that we'll get some wins out of it in the end. Yeah, and I, I believe it will be more exhausting for the ones who have been trying to prevent the change happen because yeah. now there is no other way to change uh, the pedagogical approach you are having with the students and you have to be able to force yourself into that new kind of mode to get the best possible outcome for you and for your students in this very specific, yeah. very special moment. And then from the other hand, uh, if we are looking at the positive side of the things, uh, there might be also students who are feeling extremely relaxed in this kind of environment when yeah. they are able to have total freedom of in which way and which order they want to, st they want to study. And yeah. they might be ex extremely motivated because that, that kind of a like 
responsibility of their own learning has been given to them. Yeah. Uh, and then at the same time, like mentioned earlier, then the ones who are having more problems with their learning processes might be now in, in a real danger of dropping totally out if the teachers are not able to conduct yeah. them and, and, so, and giving that supporting hand, hand for them when they are most needing it. And so I believe that after this crisis, there will be a lot of interesting case studies to go through. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad, yeah. but then at the same time, both of them are helping us to build the better education for the future. Got to hope so, eh? Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for you, evening for us. Um, I've really appreciated you making the time and thank you for letting us jiggle it the day out so I could pretend I was still having something like a wedding anniversary here in New Zealand. Um, um, really do appreciate it. I'll make sure I link up to your website and to your Facebook group under this interview and I'll make sure I share this with you um, when it goes live and thank you to everyone who's watched the interview so far and once again I've failed at my attempt to keep the interview short because I just keep talking um, so, <laughs> um, thank you so much Lars. I really do appreciate you joining us in this interview today thank, thank you. you this was a pleasure